Okay, so today we're going to talk about passive BCIs and neurofeedback. Uh, it's an interesting topic and pretty new. There's not that many people working on passive BCIs. Neurofeedback is actually quite old, but it's also somewhat unpopular these days uh, within hardcore research, but it has a lot of clinical applications. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk about neurofeedback first because I think it sets the stage for passive BCIs. They have a lot of mutual overlap. So neurofeedback is a subset of biofeedback. Biofeedback, more generally, the goal is to get some sort of signal from a subject. This could be a healthy subject. This could be a patient. And you want to use data you're getting from them in order to provide them some sort of metric that they can use to either modulate behavior, modulate their state. Uh, so a very common example is a heart rate variability biofeedback used for meditation and lowering your anxiety. Uh, I actually participated in one of these because I was really curious. So I actually, my start in this world of BCIs was with neurofeedback. And uh, I was really curious what other systems looked like. So I did this thing at the Zone, which is a really cool place on UCSD if you guys haven't been there. And they had... Some researchers come in to do some biofeedback. They hook me up to some heart rate variability. And then essentially what you wanted to do was have steady heart rate variability, I think. You either want it low or high. I can't remember which it is. And when it was in a constant state, which you can achieve by sort of getting meditative, closing your eyes, relaxing, you, I think this program automatically draws in this coloring book style page. You know, it's a, I think it was like a forest with a deer and a waterfall or whatever. And the more relaxed you were and the lower your heart rate variability was, the more this picture came in. And the goal is that's supposed to be somewhat positively reinforcing. So it reinforces the state of, you know, low heart rate variability, which hopefully has downstream effects such as, you know, lowering your blood pressure, making you less anxious, whatever. So the goal of this would be more clinical, uh, something that could actually affect the user state in a more long-term uh, manner, not just that short-term effect. So neurofeedback has similar goals most of the time. So it is just a subset of biofeedback. And what's clear to distinguish this between a BCI is that the user is not controlling something. There's no direct interface uh, in a way that's useful. So you know, with a, with a BCI, you might be making a speller, or you might be making some adaptive device, as we'll talk about with passive BCIs. But with neurofeedback, you're typically just using the user's data and giving it back to them in some meaningful way to enact a change. So the neural data that you get doesn't have to be from EEG. You can make neurofeedback with anything. You could, you know, and people have. People have done neurofeedback with EEG, with MEG, ECOGS, fMRI, everything. And it really depends on the types of problems you're trying to solve. So if you're, like, for example, let's say you want to give somebody feedback when a particular region of their brain is activated, then it makes more sense to use something like fMRI since it has better spatial resolution. And maybe if you're trying to look at more broad features of the signal, a very common use case in neurofeedback is to look at relative frequency within, or relative amplitude within certain frequency bands. Uh, then you, something like EEG is sufficient. A lot of these approaches t tend to be pretty basic. They're not that complicated. So most neurofeedback will just look at power within a band like alpha or beta or theta or whatever, and it'll make certain decisions based off of that. So, you know, if you're trying to make a user lower their or increase their attention, then maybe you'd use uh, gamma and alpha to see, okay, if, if they're in high gamma, that means they're in higher concentration. If they're low alpha, that means they're higher concentration, whatever. I'm not saying this is true. I'm just saying this is what an experimenter might do. And then you'll say, when you get into this state, you'll you know, make it so that there's a, a border around the screen that sort of indicates to the user, okay, you're doing a good job. Stay in this state. Reward them. And the user can be trained to identify that stimulus as something that's positively reinforcing. And hopefully this will maintain a change of state over a longer period of time. And again, neurofeedback is typically used in clinical applications. So for a while, there was it seemed promising for autism spectrum disorder. But recent 
papers suggest that it doesn't actually help with autism, but rather ADHD, which is often comorbid with, uh, with ASD. So neurofeedback has been shown to be pretty good for helping people with ADHD get more attention um, or reducing inattentiveness. I can't remember the directionality. But it could also be used to augment some sort of abilities in a user. So, uh, for example, you could make some system that is designed to get people in more optimal states, not that they need to be, so not in the case of ADHD where you need to just function better. It's just a strict benefit. I know that this is, this is a bit of a contentious topic, but some companies like NeuroSky and Muse are trying to get EEG headsets into the workplace in order to make more productive workers. Um, and when I've seen posts about this, I think IEEE did a blog style post about this and it made its way to Reddit on Futurology and I clicked it and everybody in the comments section is just being like, nope, nope, this sucks, society sucks, reality sucks, this is not a direction we should go down. Uh, so people don't tend to like this, uh, this approach, but it is something you can theoretically do. And most of the time, neurofeedback is only going to give you a useful signal if it's something you can't get without that neural signal. So for example, there might be other correlates to high attention or arousal that you don't even need neural signals for. So you could get that with galvanic skin response. You could get that with heart rate variability. So when you're designing a neurofeedback protocol, it might be useful to determine, is this a signal that I actually need? Now, it's possible that the combination of signals gives you more information than uh, it otherwise would, so maybe Ina could talk about this, where with like synchronizing your breathing rate and heart rate variability to your EEG data, that might be a signal that is more meaningful than using any of those others in isolation, and so you could therefore create some system that gives the user a meaningful advantage or a meaningful ability to change their state with the use of neural data. So the implementationally, in terms of the technology you're actually using, it's very similar to making a BCI, so you're still going to be processing EEG data or fMRI data or whatever in real time. You still need to get a, a signal extracted from the overall data, and you still need to do something with that extracted signal. It's just in this case, you're not going to be using that signal to control a robotic arm or to make some cursor move on a screen in order to spell. You're going to be using it for some feedback exclusively. Um, and yeah, I think this is a space that has a lot of room for development still. There's also bi-directionality that you can utilize. So, you know, neurofeedback doesn't have to just be, I'm reading a signal and I'm going to give them feedback visually or auditorily. You could theoretically make a neurofeedback system where, let's say you're doing non-invasive stuff and you use EEG to record what state somebody's in. And when you detect a state that's negative or, or you want to change, you could use something like TDCS, which are just additional electrodes on the head that you can use to actually shock the participant. And you could use some onset detected with EEG to trigger feedback through TDCS. So in this case, this would be a bidirectional system because you're not only recording from the user's neural data, you're also trying to then immediately and directly affect that neural data. Um, and I think there are some people that are doing that, but you know, the effectiveness of TDCS is pretty dependent on a lot of things, so it might, it might not generalize well. But yeah, and, and the reason why I bring up this last bullet point is because, I, like I said, I started doing neurofeedback, and one of the first tasks I was given at my lab was to write a fully online EEG processing pipeline in Object Pascal, um, which, for those of you who don't know, is a very old language, and nobody programs in it anymore. Um, but all those things made it so that when I transitioned to doing BCI research, it was super easy. I essentially knew how to do all the stuff already. So it's, it's a good path to go down. Okay, so let's juxtapose neurofeedback to passive BCIs. They were first described by Thorsten Zander, Christian Kotha, and Welka and Roting. And they developed this additionally in a 2011 paper, but no one used the term passive BCI until 2008. And the authors distinguish it in uh, BCIs into three different categories. So active BCIs are something that use only signals that are endogenous to the brain. Uh, and this would be, you know, you could think about this as something like, or actually it could be any endogenous system. It doesn't have to just be to the brain. So think of motor imagery in this case, right? All the user is doing is in their head, they're thinking about moving left or right or up or down. 
So that's a purely endogenous signal. The BCI is tasked with interpreting that signal and doing something with it. You could also put hybrid BCIs in this category. We haven't talked a lot about hybrid BCIs, but this is essentially any system that uses multiple control signals. It could be, for example, motor imagery and P300, or it could be motor imagery and eye blinks or eye movements or whatever. Um, so that would be all within the active category, as long as it's not something that the user is responding to in terms of an external stimulation. Because when they're responding to an external stimulus, then you'd put them in the reactive BCI category. So a reactive BCI would be something that utilizes a user's response to an external event. Um, a P3B speller would be an example of this, or an SSV P speller, which we'll talk about on Wednesday. In these scenarios, some stimulus has occurred on screen or auditorily or sensorily, and the user is then responding to that stimulus and the BCI is working off of that signal. Now, I don't want to confuse anybody, but a P3B system is not strictly necessarily reactive. It can be, but the P3B can be elicited by any stimulus. So you can get it from visual stimuli and auditory stimuli, which is what we use when making most BCIs, but you can get a P3B from internal cognitive stimuli. So they're not always going to be reactive just most of the time. SSVPs are always going to be reactive because you're essentially using the brain as a photosensor. So when you see a flashing light at like 10 hertz, you can pick up a 10 hertz response in the occipital cortex. Um, again, we'll talk about it more on Wednesday. And so we have active, reactive, and then we have passive. So passive BCIs are ones that get their activity just from regular events that are happening. So this could be fully asynchronous. This could be just trying to de detect changes as they occur over time. It could be synchronous locked as well. But the goal, sort of the thing that distinguishes a passive BCI from the others is that you're typically getting this information from a task that a user is performing already. So you're not having the participant complete something that is an additional layer of, OK, I'm using a control signal to, to control something consciously. The user is just doing something, and you're recording their data, and you're going to use that data for some meaningful modification of the system. So a classic example that uh, Xander and Kroll talk about in their paper that we're going to talk about today is imagine you have a system where a user is reading a book, okay? And as events happen in the book, as they're scanning through the words on the page, we can detect their brain changing. So let's say they read a passage that a certain character has something really good happen to them, right? Like, let's say character A gets $1,000 and whatever. And the user really likes that because we can get this nice response to positivity from the user when they read that something good happened to person A, then what we could do with a passive system is make a neuro, neuro adaptive book, right? So we can make it so that whenever an event is interpreted by a user, we analyze how those events are processed by the user and use it to make changes further downstream. So in this case, you could make it so that you know, things continuously happen to person A, you know. So maybe that's the kind of person you are. Maybe you're the kind of person that likes a happy ending. So you say, okay, person A gets $1,000. Maybe in the end they, you know, win the lottery and move to Jamaica and I don't know, whatever. Or, for example, you could say, okay, person, this subject doesn't really care what happens to person A. So maybe then the book goes into a completely different narrative. Maybe you're, you know, sadistic and something bad happens to person A and you really like that. Then the book goes down that direction. It doesn't really matter. The, the goal of this neuroadaptive system is to be responsive to the user's state of mind. Uh, another example of a passive BCI could be, you know, let's say you are just programming and you make an error like we all do, and you, know, you, you recognize this error really quickly and you know you're going to press Control Z, but before you can press Control Z, the system realizes that you made an error and it just macros control Z for you. So that's a very trivial example of a passive BCI because the user is already doing a task. They don't have to be aware that the BCI even exists, right? So in a, in a future world where neuroimaging is ubiquitous or something, a subject might not even know that their data is being used for a neuroadaptive task. Uh, whether or not this is ethical or moral is a completely different set of arguments. and. I think most researchers would say that 
it's probably not uh, ethical, but it is theoretically what a passive VCI could do in a situation like that. So to break it down further, passive VCIs are systems that record information from a user, just like any VCI or neurofeedback. The user is not directly controlling something, which is why it's similar to neurofeedback, but their data are being used to make some sort of meaningful modification to their environment, rather than neurofeedback, which is just trying to give the user some information to modulate their state themselves. A passive VCI is going to be part of some neuroadaptive system that is going to make that change regardless of the user's downstream input. Um, so the information from that user is used to alter the system, and this gives us an additional channel of information. So again, in the Control-Z example, we don't need just, you know, now like if we're interacting with our world with monitors and keyboards and mice, you're no longer just limited to those channels. You now have this additional channel, which is the user's raw neural signals themselves. And this can be used to create neurally adaptive systems, not just this control Z or this book, but this can be extended to general. Yeah, this can be this can be explored to infinity. There's there's no limit on what you could use. You could make somebody's entire world neurally adaptive or something like. You could you could very easily uh, maybe take this a little too far and think, okay, maybe we put some VR on somebody's face and and EEG and we can start making them seem like they're in the matrix or whatever. That that is probably theoretically not possible just because of the the quality of our recordings, right? We need we need things to be changing so quickly and with such high precision that the user would be tricked into thinking that this world is their reality. Uh, and we have actual real-world limitations in terms of the amount of useful signal we're able to get from a user's brain, at least with our current technology. Um, but if you were, and, and I don't, I'm not saying that this is going to happen, but I'm just saying if you are interested in thinking about how this connects to sci-fi and stuff, it's, uh, it's an interesting field. And I encourage stuff like this for your final project. I mean, I, for what I proposed for this class originally was very dystopian, very like, you know, taking it to the extreme just for fun. Um, and it's, it's nice to explore how some of these dystopian topics would actually emerge given our current technology, if it's possible. So we hear a lot about, you know, how BCS can go wrong in the case of the Matrix or Black Mirror or whatever. These are, these are designed to be somewhat, they're, they're supposed to be tales of warning, right? They're, they're supposed to show us how humans can utilize technology incorrectly. So an interesting thing to talk about and think about in this class, knowing a little bit about how this technology actually works, since these movies tend to be, you know, very uh, relaxed with what is actually possible. They just assume, okay, you can get literally any signals you want from the brain at any time with 100% accuracy. You guys know that's not the case, so you can think a little more critically about, okay, how would a system like this actually be created? What are the... What are the possibilities? What are the actual downsides? What are the moral implications? Thinking about this in a larger context is, is useful. It's a useful exercise. And if you have enough information, you'll realize that pretty quickly, I hope, that that reality is not particularly pressing. It's, it's unlikely to happen. Um, but it's still useful to think about. OK. So uh, I'm now going to talk about a very specific paper by Thorsten Zander, Lawrence Kroll, Niels Burbomer, and Klaus Skreman. This is one of my favorite papers. Uh, it is one of the most cited passive VCI papers, and most people in the passive VCI world you know, are inspired by this in some way. And it's neuroadaptive technology enables implicit cursor control based on medial prefrontal cortex activity. Uh, what the authors did for this was they created a, BC, a passive VCI where a user was first calibrated by seeing a cursor moving on a screen. And I'll show you an example of that. And then what they later did was had those users passively control that cursor on the screen, even though the subjects were never told that they were participating in a VCI task. So the participants thought that all they were doing was having their EEG data be recorded while they were seeing this task. Um, so even without the user's awareness, they were able to record their data and modify the state. In this case, it was a little more direct control based. Um, but they were able to move that cursor off of a user's data, even though the user was not aware that they were controlling that cursor. Uh, 
And they did ask the participants after the fact, hey, did you have any suspicion that you know, your data were being used to control that cursor? And none of them had any idea. Uh, so this is a very good application of the fact that these systems can work. Um, the reason, one of the reasons I like this paper so much is I actually did my final project on this back in 2018. Um, it was a difficult one to replicate because they used you know, state-of-the-art equipment and in a lab and with lots of subjects. And I just had me and an open BCI ganglion, which is even worse than the, uh, you know, the systems that you guys are going to have. And my project didn't end up working. So if you want to see an example of a project that was still, you know, a 20 out of 20, 100%, but didn't end up actually working in the end the way that I wanted to, you can check out my presentation. What was really nice is that at the time, uh, Lawrence Kroll, who's the, this paper is weird. It has two first authors. It's Xander and Kroll, but you can't like put them, you know, there's no way of indicating that on these things. It's indicated on the paper. So one of the first authors, Lawrence Kroll, was here in San Diego. And him and my advisor, Dr. DeSalle, graded that project together. So it was really awesome to have the person who wrote the paper originally grade my replication of the paper. Um, and that, that, yeah, that was, that was a lot of fun. And again, check out my presentation if you want to see how things can go wrong and still end up OK. Um, the thing that originally inspired me to, to do this project was Lawrence gave a talk in the class about this paper. And I immediately wanted to be like, OK, you can use this to control a cursor, and it's a passive system. But I was already doing neurofeedback stuff. And I'm like, what if I can use this cursor control to bias people towards something? So I was going to create this scenario where, rather than doing an implicit cursor control and having them go to some target, I was going to try to bias people uh, to implicitly like one, comp one made up company versus another made up company. Um, totally just for fun. I don't think you should actually ever do this, but I wanted to see if it was possible. I ended up scratching that idea because, I mean, I talk about it in this presentation briefly, but while I was doing this project, my laptop completely died and I had to start from scratch. Um, like, including I had to buy the parts to build a machine, build a machine, and then rewrite everything and collect the data. Yeah, it was, it was fun. It was hard. Um, but okay. So let's talk about the actual task itself. I, I have, uh, I missed my second monitor. Um, let me get the supplemental material. I think this one's it, okay. Okay. So I'll pause it so we can read these instructions. So each cursor movement was classified as correct or incorrect. Depending on classification, the probabilities of subsequent movements in that same direction were increased or decreased. So if the, probabil if a so if the cursor moves in a direction and the classifier says that was good, the probability of continuing to move in that direction is increased. And if it moves in a direction and the classifier is like, that's bad, the probability of moving in that direction is decreased. This video shows selected BCI supported runs along with classifier output and probabilities. So the, the subject did see the cursor movement, but they didn't see the probabilities that are going to be shown on the screen. That's just for us. Um, so on the left, the stimulus is seen by the subject. On the right, it's going to be the probabilities. The degrees that we see are based off of the angular deviance from the actual target, which I'll talk about after we see the visualization. Um, so don't worry. But we'll look at what the, what the task actually did. So I'm going to pause. The red highlighted circle is the target. So this is where the user is trying to get to. And the current red circle is where the user is. Now what happens is that there's this brief animation where the circle grows, and then it jumps to a next node. Okay. And the user is seeing this white circle grow. And then a white line and a white circle are, are directed towards the node that is jumped to. And as the circle jumps to the node, the user is having their EEG data recorded. And the system is automatically processing, filtering, binning that data, extracting features, and then putting that through a classifier. In this case, linear discriminant analysis, which we all know and love. Um, and as you can see, 
on the on the right hand side when the target when the cursor moves to a node that is closer to the target uh, we will pr prioritize that so we'll increase the probability of those events and when we see an event that is moving away from the target we will decrease that event and we're not getting information about the direction that the cursor went to so all the system has is the person's EEG data and it's able to classify whether or not the event was was good or bad and good or bad is subjective but um, which we'll talk a little bit about but in this case it's if it's zero degrees towards the target which means it's moving directly to it that is definitely good and if it's 180 degrees so it's moving literally in the opposite direction it is definitely bad uh, but there are some things in between which are slightly ambiguous that are defined as good or bad operationally, but it might not necessarily be what the user is interpreting as good or bad. So the 4x4 is what they use for the testing data. So they collected all of the data in the 4x4 scenario, and then they actually tested it in 6x6. Um, so in this case, what I want to point out is that the place where the cursor starts is always going to be on the opposite diagonal from the target and then one up so it's not going to be as far away as possible it's going to be as far away as possible and then one step closer zero degrees um, but again this is pretty good so the the authors actually go through and they simulate how many moves it takes to get to the end if you're just randomly selecting so imagine you have a uniform probability distribution of which direction the cursor is going to move in and they compare that to how long it takes the cursor to get to the end when you use the BCI and there is a statistically significant difference so you do get you actually do get information that moves the cursor to its desired location with the EEG data um, and one thing that I'll note is that whenever you complete a task like this whether it's this cursor or some cursor or some other event where you're recording these error signals it is incredibly frustrating as a subject like when you when you, when that cursor goes in the opposite direction you're you're mad like you're actually mad and when it moves in the correct direction you're like all right cool but you have to you know you can't move or anything you have to keep it keep it steady um, so you can't react but but some users have a very strong error response and some don't it's actually yeah I mean I won't go into the clinical anxiety research but the higher your anxiety, the larger your uh, your error responses are, which should make some intuitive sense, I hope. Do I have my things open still? No. Yeah. Did someone say something? Yeah. Yeah. So, good question. So, the question was, what is the classifier trying to do? Which classes is it discriminating between, essentially, right? So in this case, you're just trying to discriminate if the signal was uh, was a, a favorable response or a non-favorable response. So let me let me get to the um, let me get to the slide for that to make it a little easier. One sec. Okay. Um, so. Okay, so the only information that, I, the short answer to your question is that it's just binary. Was it a good outcome or was it a bad outcome? Now, most of us can probably agree that in the case of when, so let's imagine our cursor is right here, or my cursor is. We can all agree that if it moves directly towards the target, which is a zero degree movement, that that is a good outcome, right? That is definitely the direction that we want our cursor to be moving in. And when it moves 180 degrees, that is definitely bad. It is making negative progress towards our goal. Um, so in these cases, you know, those directions are very unambiguous. Those are good or bad. So what we can do during the, when we're training, during the training phase is we're collecting data and we can label whether or not a class is good or bad based off of the actual angular deviance of the, of the cursor's movement. So in any scenario where the cursor moves towards zero degrees, we'd label that as that's a correct movement. And whenever it moves 180, we'd say that's incorrect. Now there are certain angles and certain positions that are also pretty unambiguously bad. So in this position, moving you know, 135 degrees away from the target would definitely be bad. And that would be true in, in this direction as well. 
But there are certain scenarios where it's not clear. So if we look in the case of this cursor being on the same row as the target, moving zero degrees is definitely good, and moving 180 or 135 is definitely bad. But it's a little ambiguous whether or not 45 and 90 degrees are bad. Uh, so in these cases, we can, you know, what we can do as experimenters, and this is what they did, is you can say, okay, these scenarios are ambiguous, so we're just not going to put them in either class, and we're not going to train a classifier to detect those. So the classifier, at the end of the day, is operationally trained on these stimuli that are just the experimenter said, this is what's good and this is what's bad, and they just had to make a judgment call on that. Um, but in the real system, obviously, these ambiguous events will happen. And you can use the classifier to determine what the user thinks is good or bad. So maybe in some scenarios, 45 degrees is considered good. And in some scenarios, 45 degrees is considered bad. You don't have to make that call in real time because the user's brain is going to make that call for you. But it is important to have a classifier that can distinguish between good and bad trained on things that are at least less ambiguously good or bad. Uh, but then the classifier in the wild can, you know, it'll, it's just going to use the, the user's brain. So it doesn't, you don't have to put these in a bin. The person is going to put them in a bin for you. Um, and the actual, I think I have a slide on the, okay, so they, they used uh, stimulus locked ERPs to when the cursor moved. And they looked at 50 milliseconds after the cursor moved to 400 milli 450 milliseconds afterwards. They then did a windowed means approach, which is exactly what we did in assignment three. So you take this epoch and you subdivide that into a few bins and you just take the average within those bins and you use those as your features to then feed into linear discriminant analysis. Um, so they also did use linear discriminant analysis. So theoretically, the pipeline that we used in assignment three could be modified and we could turn that into a real time system and it would work just as well for this system as it would for a, a P3B speller. The only thing is that the window would change and maybe the filter parameters would change, but otherwise it's a very common pipeline. Using regular filtering into windowed means into LDA is like, I would, I would guess that that's at least 70% of no, all non-motor imagery, non-SSV, PBCIs. I mean, it is, it is such a common approach and it works really well, um, which is why it's so common. But if you take that same step and just re replace LDA with like support vector machines or some other algorithm, but do everything else exactly the same, you've probably captured like 85, 90% of all, of all BCI papers. Um, again, that are not motor imagery, non SSVP. And even then, in motor imagery, we'll use LDA as well, as you would have seen in assignment four. So this was my favorite thing about, about this paper because I come from clinical psychology background originally, um, before I got into cognitive science and cognitive neuroscience. And I study event-related potentials. So when I saw this graph and I saw that you have this pretty nice trend where as an event becomes less good, the ERP changes you know, accordingly. So in zero degrees, we get this really strong positivity at about 200. Then as it goes you know, down to 27 degrees, it's less positive. Then as it goes further, less positive, so on and so forth, until the things that are pretty much unambiguously negative are, you know, the ERPs have completely changed. So you lose this positive peak at 200 milliseconds and you still have a, you have a later peak actually at you know, around 300. But you can imagine that if you're training a classifier, that, and that especially when that's just based off of taking the means at these time points, that you would do a, you'd be able to do a pretty good job at uh, separating activity within this, this range. Now, like most of the plots I show you guys in this class, these are grand averages. Grand average means that you average all of the trials within a, sing, within a certain bin across a single subject, and then you average all of those activity, all of those averages from all of your subjects together. So that's what we call a grand average. So of course the ERPs look pretty nice and smooth, pretty clean, there's this distinct pattern, but there is a very low chance that you would see this pattern happening in, in real time on a single trial basis. So single trial ERPs are incredibly noisy, incredibly variable. You still can extract 
information from though. I mean, that's the whole point of these BCIs is we're training on a lot of individual observations so that we can classify individual observations. So, you know, you might think by looking at this, okay, this is easy. All we have to do is actually look at 200 milliseconds and just set a threshold. And I can do better than telling you if it was good or bad. I can tell you how good or how bad it was. But that's something you really would only be able to do at the grand average level because any individual trial is going to be, you know, somewhere in between a very large range of values. Um, so you can't be so strict. You can't overfit to the grand average when you're when you're thinking about this classification. But I love I love this figure. This figure is it shows a very it shows a similar trend that you see in a bunch of other research, which is this this scaling of goodness or badness or awareness or amplitude based off of some other external or internal characteristics of the tasks that you're performing. Um, but there are some potential flaws. So you, it's not necessarily fair to interpret this as, okay, as these deviances occur, the brain responds linearly or semi-linearly, some monotonically decreasing function off of how good or bad they were. Uh, it, there could be alternative interpretations, which if we have time, I will talk about. Um, so yeah, so just to clarify the feature extraction, they epoch 50 to 50 milliseconds. They binned according to angular deviance, which is what we've been talking about. And then they bandpass filtered the data from 0 0.1 to 15 hertz. Um, so that's a pretty strict low pass. We're not really going to be getting anything. I mean, for these types of ERPs, we don't really see signals that are much higher than 15 hertz anyway. And anything higher than that, we might categorize as muscle noise anyway. So applying a very strict low pass is not, it, it makes theoretical sense. Um, and then what we did for our windowed means was we did these eight 50 millisecond windows. So they, they're non-overlapping and you just divide the epoch into eight equally sized bins, take the mean of that, and those are your features that you then send to LDA. And I believe they used all of the channels um, in this in this example. Also, the downsampling isn't really necessary because windowed means ends up downsampling the data anyway. So even though they did downsample and that would affect how the ERPs are plotted if they applied the same filtering to their ERPs, windowed means is essentially downsampling. It's, you know, so it's it doesn't really matter that you downsample before or after. Okay, and I'll, I'll briefly go over this just because I talked about this already. But this was just them showing the, uh, the differences between a perfect system, which is the perfectly reinforced, where it's always going to be, you know, if an event is good, it's always going to get an increase in probability based off of that goodness. And, and if it's always bad, it's always going to get a uh, minus probability of those events occurring. And then the online system, which is the system actually working on a real person. And again, our classification accuracies are never 100%, so this is always going to be worse than a perfectly reinforced system. It's always going to have higher variance at the minimum because, you know, we're only going to get it right like 70 or 80% of the time. And then they compared it to random, and they find that, you know, the online system performs significantly better than the random system, but obviously not as good as the perfectly, ran the perfectly reinforced system, and that in the 6x6 condition, it actually is even better. And this makes sense because in a 6x6 grid, the likelihood of the random movement even getting to the end is like pretty low. Like there's a very low chance that you ever get to the end within a certain constrained number of possible moves. Um, so it makes sense that the online would perform considerably better than the random in six by six, but it still does perform better in, in four by four as well. Um, okay, so we'll have just enough time to talk about this interesting, this interesting phenomenon. So here are, I've, given you three plots from three different papers. Uh, lowest one is a paper from me and my advisor. And I call this figure my beautiful figure. It's actually what it's named in its files. And what my advisor and I call it. You have no idea how much work went into making. OK, so this, if you're colorblind, you'll be able to see all of these colors. And also, if you're on a black and white monitor, you'll be able to see all of these as different plots in, five, in four out of five cases. There are five different algorithms for grayscaling images, and this is going to work to discriminate the colors on all of them except for one, so I added those symbols so that you can definitely always discriminate them. 
This top one is from one of my favorite papers by Bolton Young. It is an error positivity study. So this signal right here, PE, stands for error positivity. It is related, you know, when a user commits an error, they're going to get two signals. They're going to get the error-related negativity, also sometimes called the NE, and they're going to get the error positivity, or PE. What this paper showed was that as a user, so they would have, they'd show this grid of different, different numbers of circles highlighted on a grid, and they would ask the user to say which one is bigger, and the user would respond, and then the user is prompted to indicate how confident they were on on that response. It's a, it's a speeded task, so sometimes they would definitely make, like, they would just, like, actually get it wrong, and they knew right away that they would get it wrong. So they would say, certainly wrong. And then sometimes there were, like, there was, like, one circle on one and, like, a hundred on the other. And so it's, like, unambiguous. Like, that one was definitely right. And so the user would say, they're certainly correct. And what they found was that the PE scaled with the conscious awareness of the error. And then, of course, we have Xander and Crowley tall, which we've seen the response changes as a function of angular deviance. Now, all of, and okay, so mine, I just said about the figure process, I didn't say what I actually did, was I had a, a, a P3 speller, use the P3B, and I found that as the number of possible targets increases, the P3B amplitude decreases. So I showed you the seg speller briefly, it, you know, you have all these characters that are made up of these individual segments. Essentially, as a word has more segments, the worse the P3B response is. So there's some effect in the number, of, like the visual complexity or the, the set size complexity of those stimuli and how well a person is able to determine whether or not a segment belongs to that, that letter. Um, and so we can, all, we can all, and we all have, made these assertions that, you know, this linear scaling tells us some useful information about like the the degree at which these objects are being perceived or these cases are being perceived, but a very valid alternative hypothesis, which is actually very hard to confirm, is that that's actually not what's happening. It's not that we are linearly scaling these things or scaling these things based off of the set sizes or the certainty of our error or our angular deviance, but rather in some cases, you know, like in the set of one segment for me, Every single time a person is able to determine it as, as definitely belonging in their set. But maybe in the two set, it's like 90-10. And then it goes 80-20. And then 70-30. So on and so forth. So it's not really, it, it could be that the user is not, doesn't actually have this gradated response. But because they're looking at the averages of multi, multiple stimuli, what's actually happening is that there are some events that are being interpreted as positive to the class, so they should get a P3B, or they should get an error positivity, or the angular deviance was good. But there could also be some events, given a very complex set of parameters, that means that actually sometimes you get that event, and it's just as strong as in the best case scenario. And sometimes you get the opposite. Sometimes you get an error. And when you take the average of all those stimuli, you see this gradated change. But really, if you looked at the exemplary cases of the single trials, they would all look the same. But this is very hard to actually prove is happening. Um, and this is something that my advisor actually mentioned to, to Thorsten and Lawrence. And they did a whole other set of analyses, which maybe my advisor or Thorsten can talk about at some point in a guest lecture. Um, and it's something that I'm still actively doing for my study. And it's something that Bolt and Jung mentioned in their discussion section could be happening. So this is sort of just a cautionary tale that you know, all the, although these effects are really nice and they're very convincing and they look really cool and beautiful, it, the underlying mechanics of what's actually happening in the brain might not be what we're reporting. And sometimes, that, sometimes you care and sometimes you don't care. So if you're a neural engineer like Xander and Kroll and all you're doing, you know, you're, they are very interested in the brain, but at the end of the day, they're trying to make systems that work, that are reliable. Same thing with my P3B BCI. I wanted to make a system that worked. But I'm also a cognitive neuroscientist, so I want to know why it worked or what I can do to make it better. And so are Bolton Young. So anyway, just keep this in mind when you read papers that are like this. When you see these beautiful figures, you can just peel back the onion one layer and just be like, okay, maybe that's not actually what's happening here. Um, but it might. Okay, that's everything I had for today. Uh,
midterm projects, keep thinking about them. Look for groups. Homework four is due today. Homeworks one, two, and three are all graded. I'm just going to release them in like 10 minutes probably. Whenever I can get to my computer next, I'll release them. Uh, the, the deal with regrade requests is that if it's something simple, like you accidentally put units and the auto grader said that was wrong, then you know just in the regrade say units and then we'll, we'll regrade. If there's something that's wrong with the key, you know, like if we, if we as graders made an error, just post on Piazza, you know, this question, key error. And if it's a mistake that you just want to fight for and you want to try to get points, you can try your best. We might give you partial credit, but there's a pretty, there's, there are very few cases where a genuine error has been made. Not saying that it hasn't been made, but just be sure that what you're arguing is legit because it takes us time to do regrade re requests and it takes you time to debate it. And it'll, yeah, just, just don't, don't waste anybody's time, essentially, to get points. There, there's plenty op of opportunities for points in this class, so um, don't sweat it if, uh, yeah, if you missed just a few. All right, I will see you guys on Wednesday.